Welcome everybody to Dead Talk Live, and today we have a very special guest in Hillary Burton, who is the star of True Crime Story, It Couldn't Happen Here. Hillary, thank you so much for being our guest. How are you doing today? I'm so good. Thank you so much for helping me spread the word about these cases we're covering. I, I, I want to help you spread the word. So let's just get started. Now, tell us how your involvement began with uh, True Crime Story. Before we begin, True Crime Story, It Couldn't Happen Here, is available on AMC+. Plus. For yeah. anybody who doesn't know where it's available, you can check it out on AMC+. Plus. So tell us, how did you get involved with the show? So I grew up outside of D.C., and all of our parents, either which is for the actually where I'm at right now. Are you? Oh, really? Where are you, are you? I'm in Northern Virginia. Are you? Baby, I'm from Loudoun County. I'm in Manassas. Okay. Well, then we played <laughs> each other in football, and our, probably won. So take that. Uh, so then, but you know what I'm talking about. Everybody yeah. worked in D.C. for the government, and when you're a kid growing up in that area, you know, following in those footsteps is normal, yeah. and. I thought I was going to go work for the FBI. I went to college in New York City. I was studying psychological forensics. I wanted to go to law school at the school I was going to. I was at Fordham at Lincoln Center. Mm -hmm. And then I get this job as a VJ at MTV. And then I get a job on a teen drama because I'd been acting my whole life. And um, Life goes completely in the entertainment totally world. Sideways. And... That doesn't mean I stopped caring about this subject matter. I just got involved in different ways. But I always had the luxury of living in small towns. I did a TV show for a number of years in a small town in North Carolina. And then when I met my husband, he and I moved to this small town in the Hudson Valley. And I wrote a book called Rural Diaries mm -hmm. that was a love letter to small towns. And then right after it came out, this case happened in our town where a young woman, Nikki Adamondo, was severely abused and tortured by her partner. And I watched the media coverage, which was kind of misogynistic, and I watched the prosecutor and the judge say horrific things to this victim of domestic violence, and I was pissed about it. Yeah. And then I went and I looked this judge up, and I saw all these pictures of him with friends of mine at charity events in our small town because that's what happens in small towns. Yeah. Everybody's so close together and there's so much overlap that it makes it really hard to call people out for, you know, abuse of power oh, or yeah. bad judgment because then you got to see them at the grocery store. Everybody knows everybody. Oh my god. And so if it was happening here in my town, I figured it was probably happening other places. And AMC and Sundance were great. They were like Put some feelers out. See if you can find other cases all across America. And it's just been a flood. You know, wow. they're everywhere. Um, in small towns, they don't have the advocacy or no. media coverage that we have in bigger cities. And so things like this are happening at a really frightening rate. And speaking of this area, let's take D.C., for example. You yeah. have Northwest, which is the government, Georgetown. The really touristy, nice areas. But then you have Southeast D.C. And Southeast D.C. is the part of D.C. that nobody wants to talk about. Okay? That's the where, you know, what's considered the poverty level. And it's a real shame because it's literally a tale of two different cities all confined in this single district. Uh, so that's just a whole other topic right there. Well, following the money is something that we've, we've learned a lot about on our show. We've, you know, filmed all over the United States and economics really are at the mm -hmm. core of a lot of these problems in our judicial system. Absolutely. Because if you've got the money to pay for a really great defense attorney, you're going to get off. Yeah. If you've got the money to influence elections in your community, you're going to get what you want. Yeah. And so following the money is important. So doing this job and giving a voice to people who don't have a voice anymore, you have to walk a very fine balance in telling them, telling their story, but yet also being sensitive to the families. How yeah. challenging is that? Well, 
you know, I watched a lot of true crime growing up. I used, to, I mean, when we were kids in the 90s, I would go to like video warehouse and like rent <laughs> every documentary I could get my hands on. Yeah, I'm and, the same way. Yeah, like I just was fixated on it as, at a young age. And what I found is that as true crime, the genre started exploding, it became so predatory. You know, people were getting excited to watch about the worst day of someone else's life. Yeah. There's a voyeurism to it and kind of this vulture culture. And the cases that I was interested in were still open ended and really needed help. They needed advocacy. And so if we can take that genre and remove that voyeuristic aspect and replace it with audience participation mm -hmm. and crowd involvement and advocacy and awareness it's still entertainment it's still interesting to watch yeah. but it's learning opportunity and uh, that's and important it's very important and true crime has just erupted in its popularity and there mm -hmm. are people who just take advantage of it for the entertainment value uh but then you go back to the 90s and like John Walsh uh, with America's Most Wanted, I believe. Oh. And he had skin in the game. He suffered a tragedy of his own. So he, yeah. was, he was very serious about what he was doing. Um, is there any other like differences that separate true crime story from those you know sensational other true crime stories that really separates your show from others? I mean, we do get very close with the families and the, it's not just families that talk to us, it's law enforcement mm -hmm. that also speaks to us where they're horrified by how a system that they believed in could go so terribly wrong. Um, we speak with defense attorneys, we've spoken with prosecutors this year who have admitted that things did not go the way they should have. Yeah. That's very rare to meet a prosecutor that's like, pump the brakes, this is wrong, we need to self-correct. Yeah. Um, so for us, getting the details from the family is very important. Speaking directly to people who are wrongfully incarcerated is really important. You know, before I did the show, I'd never had jailhouse calls before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now that's, part of the job and you know you build it up in your head you're like oh i'm talking to someone in jail how weird they're just like you and me they're like the kids that we went to high school with it's like talking to your old neighbor yeah you know but they're they're so grateful for the advocacy they're so grateful for the audience out there that writes letters and signs petitions on their behalf um they almost can't believe that total strangers care yeah and so last year was cool because we promoted the show by, I went on The Talking Dead after The Walking Dead aired. Mm -hmm. And we aired in our first episode of the show right after The Talking Dead. And so the AMC family got really involved yeah. and did a lot of heavy lifting. They wrote letters to the attorney general in Georgia in the Devonya Inman case. They signed petitions. They knew that there was a chance Devonya was going to be let go. Mm -hmm. And so they made a lot of noise to let all the elected officials down there know, we're watching you. Yeah. yeah. And it's, now Devonya Inman is at home with his mom and dad. It's like that's amazing. It's amazing once you get a big, powerful company on your side and they start rattling some cages. Now, when you see that your show has made even a small difference a lead popped up that was not there before that was brought to light because of what you did how does that make you feel man we're, we're in that exact situation right now last year we had a case in cookville tennessee where a man named greg lance he was a young man at the time in his early 20s, part of the National Guard, mm -hmm. was accused of a double murder and of arson, of setting these bodies on fire. And at the crime scene, across the street, lived a family that was nicknamed the Murder Clan, and they were known meth dealers in the community. Jeez. And the police never even looked at them. <sighs> they never even looked at them. And so since our episode aired about this case, 
the son of the meth dealer has come forward and said, oh no, my dad admitted to me he killed those people. There's an innocent man in jail. And a very close family friend of the wife has come forward and said, oh no, there's an innocent man in jail. She definitely killed those people. Um, so we've got two new affidavits that have been filed. The Tennessee Innocence Project is spearheading that whole thing. And I would love to say that that feels good, yeah. right? Oh yeah. It doesn't. It doesn't. No. Because the district attorney in the case still is refusing to test DNA evidence. They don't want to look bad. Evidence that has been sitting there for years. Yeah, they don't want to look bad. Yeah, because that means they can. That means they have to admit they made a mistake earlier, and yeah. that's like uh, career suicide. Yeah. It is because they're elected positions. Yeah, you can't run a campaign based no. on. Hey, I messed up a couple times and put some innocent people in prison. So they're putting their career in, down. They're putting their career in front of somebody's life, and that's yeah. just not right. Now, you've done a ton of hosting reality non-scripted shows. When you go into acting and you're portraying a character, how much of I mean, you're an obviously very passionate person about your beliefs. How do you channel that into the different characters that you play? I mean, I like flawed people. Um, I think, I think being a human is super messy. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, we all can we all just admit that now? Yeah. I wish prosecutors and judges would just admit that. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I think finding the humanity in whoever you're playing is important so whether yeah. you're doing something goofy like a christmas movie you have to believe it's real yeah whether we're doing a zombie apocalypse tv show you know you have to believe it's real um so that you can take the audience with you and you know i don't know this job it couldn't happen here has really become my primary focus so acting these days is just like vacation that's that's like easy and it's harmless and you know it's the fun time it's that's the, it that's fun there's important work to be done so the other stuff is just dessert uh now taking all that unscripted work and then having your the fun time with your with your scripted uh characters uh from what you're telling me i would say that your passion lies with the reality, the true crime, making a difference in the world. Is that an accurate statement? Yeah, I mean, crossover is a weird thing. Um, when I was coming up, I was an actress my whole life. I started doing theater professionally as, you know, an 11 year old. Wow. And when I got my job at MTV, there was this line in the sand where it's like, VJs aren't actors. That's crazy <laughs> talk. And then I became an actor and all of a sudden i would go up for hosting jobs and they're like you're an actor you can't host that's crazy talk and now i have this duality where my worlds are bleeding into one another and for instance yesterday i was doing a podcast with my girlfriends from one tree hill we have a podcast called drama queens where we go back and analyze you know the yeah. tv show we made 15 20 years ago and i'm seeing so many um, ties between the storylines in that show, mm -hmm. like the bad guys that existed in that fictional world yeah. and the bad guys I have to go deal with in the real world. Mm -hmm. Like when I was a kid making that little TV show, I would have never thought that there would be people out there killing their own relatives and doing all these dastardly things. And now that I travel the United States and I cover these stories, I know that these people absolutely exist and it's scary, but it needs to be, you know. I'm just like you and where I like to watch a lot of documentaries. And I was watching one the other day and I did not know that Wes Craven based a Freddy Krueger character off a real life person. And this real life person was such a monster that Wes Craven had to tame down Freddy Krueger. And the whole point of that is, is that reality is a lot harsher than fiction. Yeah, it really is. The The reality of things is sometimes too much for people to take when they go to entertainment and go to the movie theaters, sit in front of their TV. And it even ha reality has to be tamed down 
for it to be oh. considered quote unquote entertainment. Now, speaking of One Tree Hill, I mean, when you started that, did you have any thought that you would be in like 130 episodes and this show would become the sensation that it became? I mean, I bought a house like three or four months into filming that show. I was really cocky. I was like, we're going to go forever. <laughs> and every, I mean, they kept threatening to cancel us every single year. They were like, we don't know. You guys aren't that cool. Um, we weren't edgy. We weren't like sexy, we were just kind of like dorky kids and it wasn't necessarily attractive to a studio, but there was always one or two people that really believed in us. Mm -hmm. And so I was talking about it. I bought a house and uh, that that worked out. That worked out really <laughs> well. And you were on a roll because once One Tree Hill was over, you got a role as Sarah Ellis in White Collar. So you go from one hit show to another hit show. So you said you were cocky. By that point, you must have been like in the clouds. You're like, wow, I'm on fire. Uh, walk us, I mean, take us back to your mind frame back at that time, going from one I mean, hit might, show to another. It might be like the psychology and criminology courses I took in college, <laughs> like trying to like read people and read situations. Um, yeah, that's a, that's something everyone should study. What a good skill set. Yeah. Uh, knowing, knowing places where I was surrounded by good people, were, that was my priority. Mm -hmm. And I was offered things leaving One Tree Hill that I was like, eh. You know, everybody wants you to do edgy movies where you play a heroin addict and you take a shirt off. Yeah. Uh, so you get out of that teenage bubble. Um, and instead... I got to go work with a teenage icon of mine, Tiffany Thiessen, who mm -hmm. was on Saved by the Bell. Mm -hmm. And that was the perfect person to work with after leaving a teen drama because she was like, don't you ever badmouth the show that paid your mortgage yeah. and don't ever disrespect the fans who loved you on that show don't be embarrassed, like celebrate this thing that you made as a little kid. And she really empowered me to not play that embarrassed card. It was like, yeah, I, I did make something that was nice as a youngster, you yeah. know, she was, she was a really, really good role model for me. One so of I my very first guests was Michael Cudlitz. And, oh, it's wonderful. And I sort of teased him of being him being Shannon Doherty's date in 90210. <laughs> he fully embraced it. You know, yeah. I was sort of teasing him about it, but he embraced yeah. it because he's like, yeah, you know, and I, I'm proud of that because that led to the next step and to the next step and to the next step. So what Tiffany told you is absolutely true. Don't ever look down on what you've done on the past because if it wasn't for that you wouldn't be where you are today you no know? everything's a learning opportunity um and you know it's really easy when you're a kid to kind of get swept up into negative thinking or trying to be too cool for school yeah and so it was nice to have someone just a little bit older be like cool's overrated yeah be classy about it. Be yourself, most of all. Now, where I really got to know you as an actor was in Extent as oh, Anna. <laughs> uh, I loved you in that like role. Aliens. You know, you that was like a sort of a villainous, bad guy, government agent overlooking the AI robotics program. Uh, what was your assessment of that character? Did you enjoy your time on Extent? I liked that my husband and I were working on the same show. That was our first venture into that. And it was really nice because we could go home at the end of the day and have a shorthand. Um, and in our industry, that's pretty rare. Yeah. You no, know, usually we're on different sets. We're in different states. There's a distance that can be weird. Mm -hmm. And so when you get the opportunity to be literally in the same zip code, in the same house, on the same soundstage, that's yeah. amazing. And so we liked that a lot. I got to re-team with Tyler Hilton. Mm -hmm. And this was a little bit trippy for me because on One Tree Hill, he played someone who was like older than us and a yeah. bad guy. Yeah. And then he and I did a movie together where we played love interests. <laughs> so he was older than me 
And then we were the same age. And then on an extant, just like a year or two later, I'm playing his superior, some like older lady. And he's supposed to be some, you know, goober youngster. And uh, I was like, you know, Tyler Hilton, I get older. He stays the same age. <laughs> How do you like playing like these villainous type roles? Do you have fun with them? Almost everybody I speak with who plays a bad guy, they love it. They love it. They're, it's, they're like, it's it's the funnest thing in the world. You go bad. You never go back. <laughs> you know? uh, Jeffrey, Jeffrey and I have very similar taste in in the roles and the stories that we're attracted to mm -hmm. um, because we like humanizing people who are misunderstood. Yeah. That's fun. That's like a yeah. fun day of work on yeah. a film set. It's make it a, make sense. Make, if you can make the audience love a bad guy, you're good at your job. Yeah, and he uh, he's pretty good at that. Especially yeah, it's kind, of, <laughs> kind of dad's bread and butter. That's what he does. So now let's talk about to Lucille, all right? You gave us a face to the infamous Lucille in the Walking Dead universe. First of all, what was it like to get your name etched? in the history of that world of that universe well tell us what that felt like that was wild i mean so i guess jeffrey started doing the walking dead when our son was six and gus is going into seventh grade now wow you know it's been our whole well he's so so, so seven eight nine ten eleven like plus seven, COVID, seven like six yeah. seven years yeah yeah and it's all our daughters ever known and so I knew the fan base was incredibly loyal and really passionate about not just the show, but then any other side hustle people have going on. Oh, yeah. You know, Michael Cudlitz has his whiskey bar, you know, and everybody's got these other ventures that the fan base also shows up for, and they're really remarkable. We started doing a charity in our town here called Ghost Stories to raise money for a kids' residential treatment center. And it was all Walking Dead fans. They all showed up and they were amazing. And so the commingling of One Tree Hill fans and Walking Dead fans <laughs> delights us to no end. <laughs> um, I imagine. But then we were in the midst of the pandemic when we got the phone call that they wanted to do this bottle episode that was about Negan's backstory. Mm -hmm. and the fan base would be introduced to Lucille and the walking dead bosses are all buddies. They'd all been at our wedding. They'd all seen Jeff cry when we exchanged vows and they knew that I love making him cry. So <laughs> they were like, they're like, just leave them together. They'll do it. It'll be fine. Of, the, um, of those six bonus episodes that were given to us during the COVID period. I mean, I think that has to be everyone's favorite where we got to, see Lucille, you know, it was more than a bat, you know, up until then, Lucille was just a memory that he put into a bat. What was it that you personally wanted to give Lucille, something of Hillary that you wanted to instill into the character of Lucille? Yeah, I mean, it was important to me that, that she was a ballsy woman. Well, she was. You know, you don't mourn someone who's a pushover or a wallflower. I mean, this is someone who had to deal with Negan on a daily basis yep. and also give him marching orders that sent him off into the apocalypse. Yep. Um, and I think the timing of that story was just so weird because we were all in the midst of this pandemic. We filmed the episode when we still didn't have any answers. We didn't really know how it was spread. Yeah. We didn't know, like the election was happening while we were filming. There was a lot of unrest and turmoil in our country. And so it felt apocalyptic in yeah. real life. And then we would go to set. We lived on the set. Mm -hmm. um, Alexandria was a little yeah. subdivision that had been walled off and we lived in Rick's house. Wow. And so we would walk to work every day across the street to this garage that had been converted into Negan's basement. 
And the apocalypse felt real in real life. And it felt real in the show because we all were dealing with having lost loved ones. Um, and so when Negan and Lucille are telling each other how much they love each other and like, go on and live without me, there was a little part of that that felt real. Like, yeah. I just want to say this to you on the off chance something goes wrong, but I want it recorded for all posterity. <laughs> like, <laughs> I love you, go be happy, fight like hell. Yeah, That's the important thing to tell your partner. And one thing I don't think AMC even anticipated was that episode with Negan and Lucille was a real pivot into the Negan that we have today. Um, mm -hmm. Because it showed us him before the apocalypse. And he he was a gym teacher. He had that. He did cheat on Lucille. Yeah. But she, you, she knew about it and she, you know, had basically forgiven him. But it, it really, I don't even think AMC had planned this. But because of COVID, it allowed that episode to happen. And I think the fans really helped transition into the Negan that we have now and were are much more accepting of the good Negan that we have now. And it's all because of that episode, that single episode between you and Jeffrey. And well, the-, the That's nice of you to say, but he, honestly, um, the work that my husband puts into his character, oh. like I wish people could see him studying oh. he it's so much to learn negan's speeches his monologues just learning the words is hard yeah. but then figuring out how to make it make sense and make people feel sorry or just connected to this character it's a lot of of work yeah. and so what was great about that episode is that it normalized negan it took him from being this cartoon dastardly bad guy yeah. to your friend on Facebook that you went to high school with that mm -hmm. is like married to another girl you went to high school with. And you're like, those two seem messy. Okay. Yeah. It just normalized yeah. him in a way where you're like, Oh, I know that guy. I wonder what would happen to him if an apocalypse hit, yeah. you know, we watched a lot of our friends spin out during the pandemic and you're like oh they wouldn't have survived yeah yeah, yeah. You were it real time. yeah it made him human it humanized him uh i can't believe we're 30 minutes in hillary i want to thank you so much this has been a fascinating discussion i thoroughly enjoyed it again guys the show is called true crime story it couldn't happen here is there a season two in the works yeah, I mean, this is season two that starts airing tomorrow. So we did oh. six episodes last year. We're doing eight cases this year. If you have AMC Plus, not only will you get to see the first episode a little bit early tomorrow, but you'll get to see the first two episodes, which is cool. That's very cool. Um, and so for everyone else, Sundance, 10 p.m. on Thursdays is when we're airing. And last year I live tweeted during the episodes, and that was just like, it was too hard because you're just trying to keep track yeah. of threads and things. This year, I'm just going to go live on Instagram, 10 p.m. Eastern time. And if you have questions about the cases, if you want to talk through it, if you want to have information about what was going on behind the scenes, I'm available. Oh, and yeah. so the more eyes we can get on these cases, the more petitions and letters and all that good stuff. Everybody getting it. together can make a difference. So, guys, check it out true crime story it could happen here uh tomorrow on amc plus thank you again to hillary burton i want to thank our audience those who are tuning in live and those of you who'll be watching this later on do you have any final thoughts you want to share before we go yeah follow us at i c h h stories it couldn't happen here stories um, on Instagram, because that is where we're compiling all of the resources for all of our cases. So if you want to sign a petition, if you want to call an attorney general, if you want to do any of the activism, that's where we're collecting it. All right. You guys heard it here. Again, a big thank you to Hillary Burton. Thank you to our audience. On behalf of Hillary and myself, stay safe and stay walking. Bye, everybody. <laughs>